turn together in our copies of God's Word to the prophecy of Daniel, the 8th chapter. So Daniel 8, verse 1 through 27. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, after that which appeared to me at the first. And I saw in the vision, and when I saw, I was in Susa, the capital, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in the vision... And I was at the Ulai Canal. I raised my eyes and saw, and behold, a ram standing on the bank of the canal. It had two horns, and both horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the other one came up last. I saw the ram charging westward and northward and southward. No beast could stand before him, and there was no one who could rescue from his power. He did as he pleased and became great. As I was considering, behold, a male goat came from the west across the face of the whole earth without touching the ground, and the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. He came to the ram with the two horns which I had seen standing on the bank of the canal, and he ran at him in his powerful wrath. I saw him come close to the ram, and he was enraged against him and struck the ram and broke his two horns, and the ram had no power to stand before him. But he cast him down to the ground and trampled on him. There was no one who could rescue the ram from his power. Then the goat became exceedingly great, but he was strong, uh, but when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and instead of it there came up four conspicuous horns towards the winds, the four winds of heaven. Out of one of them came a little horn which grew exceedingly great towards the south, towards the east, and towards the glorious land. It grew great even to the hosts of heaven, and some of the hosts and some of the stars it threw down to the ground and trampled on them. It became great, even as great as the prince of the host, and the regular burnt offering was taken away from him, and the place of sanctuary was overthrown, and a host will be given over to it together with the regular burnt offerings, be, be, offering because of transgression, and it will throw truth to the ground, and it will act and prosper." When I heard a holy one speak, then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the one who spoke, For how long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering, the, trans- the transgression that makes desolate, and the giving over of the sanctuary and host to be trampled underfoot? And he said to me, For two thousand three hundred evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary will be restored, shall be restored to its rightful state. When I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. And behold, there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Ulai, and it called, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood. And when he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. But he said to me, Understand, O son of man, that the vision is for the time of the end. And when he had spoken to me, I fell into a deep sleep with my face to the ground. But he touched me. And made me stand up, and he said, Behold, I will make known to you what shall be at the latter end of the indignation, for it refers to the appointed time of the end. As for the ram that you saw with the two horns, these are the kings of Media and Persia. And the goat is the king of Greece. And the great horn between his eyes is the first king. As for the horn that was broken in place of which four arose, four kingdoms shall arise from his nation, but not with his power. And at the latter end of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their limit, a king of bold face, one who understands riddles, shall arise. His power shall be great, but not by his own power. And he shall cause fearful destruction and shall succeed in what he does and destroy mighty men and the people who are the saints. By his cunning he shall make deceit prosper under his hand, and and in his own mind he shall become great. Without warning he shall destroy many, He shall even rise up against the prince of princes, and he shall be broken, but by no human hand. The vision of the evenings and mornings that has been told is true, but seal up the vision, for it refers to many days from now. And I, Daniel, was overcome and lay sick for some days. Then I rose and went about the king's business, but I was appalled by the vision and did not understand it. So far, the reading from God's word this evening. May he add his blessing to our hearts. I have a, a younger brother, 
11 years younger than me. Hans is his name. He was born in Holland. That's why he has the, the name Hans. And uh, in my younger days, uh, as an older brother, 11 years older than he was, I was exceedingly uncompassionate towards him. Uh, we had a, a ritual, which he kind of enjoyed whenever we would start it, but at the end he was always in tears. And the ritual was we would pretend that we were wrestling in the WWF, as it was at the time. And uh, so we would go up to my parents' room, and they had a big bed, and we could wrestle on it. And, and I would throw him around for a while because he was little, and I, and I was much bigger than he was. And at the end, I would dance around him with my father's weight belt, and it would look like the title belt, and, and he would scream in agony, and I thought it was great. In my sin, that's not an encouragement to any children. So uh, that was all great and fine for the first 15 years of his life. Uh, but something happened. Something happened when he turned 15. And what happened when he turned 15 is that he began to become fairly significantly bigger than I am. And that's, of course, not a, a terribly trying feat for anybody. But in this particular case, he is now uh, six foot two and 220 pounds, which I am not, in case you hadn't noticed. And uh, so I remember uh, the, his 15th birthday, he was, they lived in California, of course, we lived in Canada. And so he came to Canada on his 15th, birth, 15th birthday. And I remember thinking, this is getting challenging to contain this fellow while we were wrestling, because he still enjoyed wrestling. Well, the next time I saw him, he was 18, and he was full grown, and he, was, he had uh, the longest two-week vacation I have ever experienced, and he came to visit us in Canada again, and he tied me in a pretzel that whole vacation. Uh, he tied me in a pretzel and, and just did not let me go. Now, there's a progression, of course, in, in Hans's life where he moved from being the one who was in tears to the one who was causing the tears uh, in my life. But I want us to imagine Hans as a three-year-old when I was still flipping him around and, and, and wrestling with him and, and tormenting him uh, in a certain sense. If only Hans knew as a three-year-old what would happen when he was an 18-year-old. It would have made his younger years a lot more hopeful, wouldn't it? If he knew that the deliverance and the reversal of fortunes was coming, it would have been easier to bear up under the hardship that I was causing for him. Because in hardship, there is hope if you know that deliverance is coming. Isn't that the truth? You can bear up under hardship much easier if you know this hardship is going to last for a week or for two weeks, or for a certain specified period of time. And here in the eighth chapter of Daniel's prophecy, you have the laying out of the hope of the people of Israel. That's what we have in our prophecy, that in affliction, the people of God can rest in the certainty that man's hand can never triumph over God's. That's what Daniel is reassuring the people of Israel who are in exile at this particular time. That's what he's, uh, he's reassuring them of. And to see that truth in this chapter of Scripture, we're going to first look at the power of man as it's described in these two kingdoms, the kingdoms of the Medes and Persians and the, kingdoms of the, Greek, the kingdom of the Greeks. And then also we're going to look at the limits of man, which is really where the hope is is found in this particular passage. So, in affliction, the people of God can rest in the certainty that man's hand cannot triumph over God's people. And so first we're going to look at the power of man, and then next we're going to look at the limits of man. So let's begin by considering the power of man as it's recorded for us in the first 25 or so verses of this chapter. Again, uh, when we come to Daniel's prophecy at the beginning of this chapter, you see chronology isn't the primary motivation of Daniel's prophecy. The, the timeline of this book, of course, has, has skipped around some, and the, the furthest along we've been in history is in, in Daniel chapter 6, where we're in the first year of Darius the Mede and, and his rule and reign, which is further along than where we are here. It, Daniel's uh, the reign of Darius the Mede began somewhere around 546 B.C. Now, this vision is in the third year of Belshazzar, which is 
Uh, it's about 10 years earlier, maybe even 13 years earlier. And so we always remember when we come to the book of Daniel, our primary concern is not chronology. Uh, Daniel isn't attempting to give a complete history of Babylon. He's not attempting to give a complete history of Israel even. Uh, he is choosing parts of history, which are true history. He's choosing parts of history uh, to set before us a picture of the sovereignty of God. And so Daniel's first vision in, in chapter 7 was around 555 B.C. And now here, two years later, in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, he has a, a second vision. And last Lord's Day, as we considered that vision from chapter 7, we were quick to point out that we would, were to be careful with assigning identities to the parts of Daniel's vision. It doesn't matter if it's the beast that looked like a lion or a bear or a leopard or the, the, the animal, the beast that defied description. In any case, the temptation to, assi to assign identity to those beasts was to be resisted. And, and we base that on the fact that God in His wisdom doesn't include that in that passage of Scripture. He certainly could have, uh, but he chose not to. The purpose and the point of, of that particular passage was, was quite uh, different. But in this particular case, that caution of not assigning identities is not applicable because in this particular chapter and in this particular vision, God does clearly set before Daniel the identity of the different nations that are being described. And so in this vision, in the 8th chapter, Daniel sees two beasts. Uh, the first one is a ram, and it has two horns. One is bigger than the other, and, and this, ram's power is, this ram's power is great, and, and he can't be withstood. It says in, in verse 4 uh, that as this ram is charging around all of the world, it says no beast could stand before him, and there was none who could rescue from his power. Of course, we know uh, last week when it described the four beasts, there the prophet Daniel was speaking of four kingdoms of men. And we are to understand beasts in the same way in this chapter. Uh, no kingdom could stand before this one kingdom that is charging around all uh, the world. <laughs> and so in this vision, you have a, a, the ram representing a kingdom that, that conquers all. He, he charges from west to north to south. And <clears throat> it says that nothing could stand against him. And the ram uh, with uh, two horns then is the, the superpower of its day. They had all the army's strength that was needed to <coughs> control all their world. Now, if you're around my age and, and upwards, you will remember that during the Cold War, there were two superpowers in the world. One was the United States of America, and the other one was the Soviet Union, or the USSR. And with the same abruptness as is in this passage, something changed in the makeup of the superpowers of the world in the 1980s as well. <clears throat> so you have first the kingdom that does as it pleases. No one's there able to keep him in check. And that's exactly uh, what life was like in terms of my perspective, at least from a child's perspective, when it came to the Soviet Union. They seemed to do what they wanted. They were powerful, they were mighty, and, and from my limited understanding of how things worked, there was no end in sight of their, uh, their dominance over the region that, they, that they, were, um, they were governing, they were ruling. They seemed like a, a completely autonomous giant, but of course the Soviet Union isn't around today anymore. The Soviet Union has turned into Latvia and Belarus and Georgia, Ukraine, Armenia, and and 10 other nations. The biggest nation, of course, Russia, it's still strong, but it's, it's not like it, it used to be, not like it once was. And so you see that sometimes in geopolitics, right? Uh, nations uh, sometimes change in their uh, influence because of implosion, and I, as far as I can tell, that was the case with the Soviet Union, that they, uh, they were rotted from the inside. But at other times, uh, the change in power comes through external subjection of a once powerful nation. And that's true on a geopolitical level, but we also know this to be true in just our day-to-day -day lives, right? You can think about that in, in terms of sports franchises, right? Uh, 
uh, don't want to get too far into this, but uh, in the NBA, the, uh, the Golden State basketball team won the, the championship. Well, when I was growing up watching basketball, they were the laughing stock of the league. Nobody ever paid any attention to them because they were always in last place. And so you see that in sports franchises and uh, where, where, where a team that once was dominant now is, is, uh, is waning in its influence and is not able to defeat other teams that are more powerful and that have better players uh, than, than they do. The same thing is true with corporations, right? Uh, who, uh, well, I don't, I don't want to insult people. I, I hope you're not insulted, but, but uh, you know, who's using uh, AOL or who's using Netscape or who's using those things? Those technologies have been replaced and, and other uh, more influential companies have, have, have replaced them. So you see that there can be an external subjection of, uh, of a company, but in this particular case of a, of a nation. So the vision shows at first a ram, and that ram in our vision here is described as being defeated uh, by a goat. Now, uh, the reason for a ram and a goat, we're not told. They simply are representing these two kingdoms. Now, the goat replaces the ram. He, he destroys him. He tramples under his foot. And, and this, this second nation, this goat, uh, beginning in verse 5, it's being described for us as having this Large first horn, conspicuous, simply means an obvious, an obvious first horn, which is broken, and, and it becomes four horns, out of which one prominent horn develops, which attacks even the hosts of heaven, it says. And so this ram is also uh, said that he will uh, disrupt the sacrificial system of the people of uh, Jerusalem, that he will even attack the... Uh, that he would even attack God himself and the worship of his people, but that his duration is limited to 2,300 evenings and mornings, as it's described in verse 14. Now, I go through this vision fairly quickly, and as I've gone through it fairly quick, quickly, perhaps in your own mind you're thinking, well, this is not really that much different from the vision of last week. The vision last week also spoke of uh, beasts and, and dominance and power and waxing and waning of, of these particular powers. But the interpretation of these different visions is, is, is not the same. Whereas the vision of Daniel 7 isn't clarified in terms of identities and in terms of characters, uh, the, this second vision here in, in Daniel chapter 8 most certainly is. This vision in this chapter is interpreted by Gabriel. Gabriel, the angel who appeared to Zechariah to announce that uh, he would have a son. The uh, angel Gabriel who appear, appeared to Mary to announce the coming of the Savior. And his message is from the Lord. He stands in his presence. Why is Zechariah's mouth shut as he waits for his son John to be born? It's because he takes the message of Gabriel who stands in the presence of God and is a messenger directly from God to man. And he says, I don't, I don't believe it. And that was the essence of Gabriel's uh, indiscretion. And, and this Gabriel, this influential angel comes to Daniel to communicate the interpretation of this vision that he has seen. And so in verse 18, you see uh, the a angel Gabriel beginning his interpretation uh, of the vision. In verse 19, uh, he, he begins to announce to Daniel the, the meaning, and he says that this will take place at the latter end of the indignation, that this was something that has to do with the time of the end. Now, we can ask ourselves, which end is he talking about? Is the end uh, the end of the, uh, of the exile? Well, I think in this particular case, the end is the end of the actions of that last king who will interrupt the sacrificial system. This end of this king is appointed. It's not something that's random. God has appointed it. And again, so we see the sovereignty of God in the book of Daniel, that time is under his control. And, and that includes the times of deliverance for the people of God. There will be two superpowers that come next. Remember, Daniel here is in the reign of the Babylonian kingdom. 
And Daniel is speaking to him about the reign of the Medes and the Persians and the Greeks. So God in his wisdom is making known to Daniel the next two superpowers and that at the end of the second superpower, his people will be uh, delivered. His people will have relief from their oppression. And so uh, this first ram, this great power who does what he wants, who has two horns and the one is greater than the other, uh, Gabriel identifies that kingdom for us in verse 20. In verse 20, he says that this uh, kingdom is the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians, a kingdom that has not yet been established. This is uh, seven years out from when Belshazzar will be slain, as we read, have read about it in, in the end of Daniel 5. But this uh, this, 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 uh, this ram, this kingdom of the Medes and Persians, it's, it's marked by two horns. You notice this on the, on the ram. One is greater than the other. Uh, the Medes and the Persians, uh, two allies which are eventually swallowed into one, the Persian Empire. The Persian Empire eventually becomes the greater of the two empires. Because Gabriel identifies the nation, you can look in the rearview mirror in a sense and, and understand what has taken place uh, in history, uh, the Medes are surpassed by the Persians eventually. And, and so that, that kingdom, this, this first kingdom, will do as it pleases, as it grows in power. But then you have the second goat from verses 5 through 8, uh, this uh, second beast, the goat. And, and that's the kingdom of Greece as it's described for us in, in verses 22 uh, through 25. Uh, you have uh, this, this kingdom of the Greeks, which begins with this one singular large horn. And that, of course, is the great king Alexander the Great, who reigned from 336 to 323 B.C. He is the large horn. And, and when it speaks of this, this goat traveling across the world in, in great swiftness, that, of course, was how Alexander conquered. Alexander uh, conquered very quickly, he ascended to power as a very young man, and he had tremendous success. And his, his rule and reign was marked by passion, it was marked by war, but he dies at a very young age. And when he dies, his kingdom is divided into four nations, which, of course, is described here by Gabriel, or by uh, Daniel to us, as the one horn being replaced by the four horns. The generals of King Alexander's army divide his kingdom into four parts, the Macedonian kingdom, the Egyptian kingdom, the Mesopotamian kingdom, and Pergamon. Uh, the, the division of this kingdom is, is not peaceful. These generals don't, don't kind of play rock, paper, scissors to see who gets what. Uh, there is intrigue, there is deceit, uh, there is war as they, uh, as they go through this process, this stormy process of dividing the great empire of Alexander the Great. And the ebb and flow is primarily between two kingdoms, the Egyptian kingdom and the Mesopotamian kingdom. And they eventually become known by the dynasties that rule over them. In Egypt, you have the, the Ptolemies. It's a silent P at the beginning. But the, the Ptolemies rule and reign in Egypt. And in Mesopotamia, the Seleucid Empire, the Seleucid dynasty uh, rules and reigns. And so uh, as, as this ebb and flow is between uh, Egypt and, and Mesopotamia, or between the Ptolemaic and the Seleucid empires, there's a competing for dominance. And there is one Seleucid king in particular, uh, this one horn that grows to prominence uh, from the four horns. And, and this particular Seleucid king, his name is Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus Epiphanes is a blasphemer, even in how he identifies himself. He calls himself the glory of heaven, in a sense. And so this king is cunning. He uses surprise against his enemies. And on several occasions, without provocation, sacks Jerusalem, killing tens of thousands of Jewish people and defiling the temple in the process, uh, doing that which was unimaginable, uh, to the Jewish people, sacrificing a pig in the Holy of Holies. And so he was seen as the abomination that causes uh, desolation in that sense. Now all of that is interesting. Uh, it's interesting to see how God speaks so clearly of history, even centuries before it takes place, even 
220 years before what takes place. But what's more important to note is that Daniel speaks with this precision about things that happen yet in the future. He speaks of kingdoms that have not assumed power. And therein you see an affirmation of who Gabriel is, of who the deliverer of this message is. Gabriel is a messenger from God, and he could have been even more specific had he wanted to do so. But the outline for the future kingdoms is already there. It's, it's clearly uh, in God's mind, and he communicates it here to Daniel. What's he setting before Daniel? He's setting before Daniel uh, the power of the kingdoms that are to come. The people of Israel will, will live under the oppression of these kings, and, and God knows exactly when and where they will arrive. And so Daniel first tells us of the power of man in the first 25 verses of this 8th chapter. But then he also speaks of the limits of man in the second half of verse 25 on. If, if Daniel didn't continue on to speak of the limits of man, the 8th chapter would have been very much like the 7th chapter or like the 2nd chapter. Uh, but here, uh, there's not so much of a focus on the movement of geopolitical kingdoms, even though that's present in this chapter. But here, the oppressor of God's people, though he seems to operate without any kind of accountability whatsoever, is brought low by God when God so chooses. Now, this king who is so great that he thinks he can blaspheme the living God, this Antiochus Epiphanes, he is, he is, he is broken. And it says in our passage that he is broken. And in verse 20, at the end of verse 25, it says, but by no human hand. This king is, is erased, but by no human hand. And so within this chapter, as we're dealing with the progression of nations and empires, there is also an element of redemption in it, isn't there? Because not only are we talking about the progression of nations, but we're talking about how God through the progression of nations, will bring deliverance to his people again. There will come an end to the oppression of this, this fourth king who, who seems to blaspheme against heaven and, and get away with it. But there will come a time when, when that will end, uh, 2,300 evenings and mornings. It's not clear exactly what the timing means, but there will be a limit to what this king can do. And so, uh, in a sense, in the negative... There's a part of a redemption story of the people of God. What is true of, of Nebuchadnezzar, what is true of, of Belshazzar, what is true of the Medes and the Persians, what is true of the Greeks, what is true within the Greek empire of Antiochus Epiphanes is true of all men. There is a final condemnation that waits for all men who position their, themselves against God in this way. And herein is a common cry from Scripture. Repent of your rebellion against God. This is the, the focus of Scripture, this call for redemption that issues from Genesis all the way through Malachi and from Matthew all the way through Revelation. It's the same cry. Don't set yourself against the God of heaven and earth. And this is why the church is charged to proclaim Christ and, and Him crucified. Because without Christ and Him crucified, this very fate that awaits Antiochus Epiphanes and the Medes and the Persians and the, and the Greeks in general, it is a reality for every person that walks on the face of the earth. The fate of these powerful nations, beloved, it should terrify us. It should terrify us. It should strike within our hearts fear and trembling. No matter how strong, no matter how mighty you are, Daniel teaches us today, you are accountable to the God of heaven. There is no escape for you. You will stand before him at his appointed time. And if you're not in Christ, you will have to admit you've fallen short of his glory. And what is true of Israel living in need of deliverance is also true of the New Testament church. There may be seasons of oppression or 
for some of our brothers and sisters in other lands, even seasons of persecution. But those forces, those powers, are in the hands of the Lord as well. Their time will end as well. And like it's true in Daniel 8, their time will end, but not by human hand. It will end because of the declaration of God Almighty. The only way accountability to God is not something of terror for any human being is if Christ is understood as the only hope. The anguish of Israel, the church in exile, it's a temporary condition. But the anguish of Babylon, the anguish of Persia, the anguish of Greece, it's a permanent anguish. It will not be removed from them. God is the God of all the world, and when man sets himself up against him in rebellion against it, it's only a matter of time before judgment is poured out on him. And so this is the message of all the Bible. This is the message that begins in Genesis, in the first book that Moses writes, and it begins right after the fall of Adam and Eve, that first act of rebellion. You remember it? God says, don't eat of any of or don't, you can eat of any of the trees, but not of the tree of the knowledge in, of good and evil. And Eve, like that small horn that becomes great, takes a swipe at heaven, doesn't she? She says, well, that fruit looks good to me. And this talking serpent has told me that it is good for me to eat it, so I think I will do what I want to do instead of, God, what you would have me do. But God doesn't leave mankind there. He sets before man this hope of salvation that belongs to us from the very beginning of time. And it comes to us through Abraham, the, the patriarch of the people of Israel. And what does he say to Abraham? He says, I'm going to give you land, and I'm going to give you seed, and through you and your family, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. All the nations. All the nations will be blessed through Abraham's seed. And it continues on in, in Scripture when it comes to King David. Then God comes to David when he wants to build a temple for him. And, and God says to him, no, you're not the one to build a temple for me because there's blood on your hands. But I tell you what, David, I'm going to make for you a house, an eternal house. And from your line, an eternal king will sit on the throne, a, a kingdom that will never end, a kingdom that will never fail. And, and later on, to Joseph, a descendant of the line of David, and to Mary, his betrothed, is born Jesus. And John the Baptist, the last Old Testament prophet, in the sense, he announces this Jesus, and he says, what does he say about him? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This, this, this rebellion of Antiochus and Epiphanes, or the Medes and the Persians, this failure to acknowledge God as God, and, and that deliverance comes from Him. It leads to a, a judgment, but not by human hand. It might look like it has a human hand. It might look like the hand of, of Alexander the Great when you're Xerxes, right? It might look like that. Or uh, for, for, for Alexander, it may look like that disease that killed him, what, whatever that was. Nobody's really sure what happened. It might look like it has a human hand. It might look like it has a physiological explanation. But it's the hand of God. It's the hand of God over his creation. And so uh, what is true of Israel needing in, living in need of deliverance is, is true of us as his church in the New Testament age as well. Whatever force is, is in hostility against us, whatever force may be persecuting us even, maybe uh, for our brothers and sisters in foreign lands, they're being asked to surrender their lives. This, this time will come to an end, but not by human hand. And so Christ must be understood as the hope of all people. To escape that permanent anguish that belongs to those who live in rebellion against God. Uh, God is God of of all the world. And we must acknowledge that, that our deliverance comes only from Him, through His Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. So when we think of a, a destruction that is not by human hands, we, we must therefore 
learn as we cope with our sin to turn properly, deal with our sin properly. Now, how do we deal with our sin properly? How do we cope with the sin that we have? Should we try to outlast God? Well, that's not possible because God's eternal and infinite and, and we're not. So, we can't outlast God. Should we try to overpower Him, maybe? Well, that's a laughable idea because God's omnipotent. He's, he has all power. And again, uh, we do not. So to try to overpower God is a, is a laughable proposition. Uh, maybe uh, we should try to hide from Him. Well, it's nonsensical because God is omniscient. He's present everywhere. You can't go anywhere, Psalm 139 tells us. You can't go anywhere to hide from God. So how do we deal with this sin of ours? How do nations deal with their sin? There's only one hope for all the nations, and that's found in God and in His Christ. I want to read for you from Jeremiah 14. And in Jeremiah 14, there is a section uh, that compares turning to idols to turning to God. Listen to these words. This is the prophet Jeremiah crying out to the Lord. He says, Do not spurn us for your name's sake. Do not dishonor your glorious throne. Remember and do not break your covenant with us. This promise that I've outlined for us that begins in Adam. Are there any among the false gods of the nations that can bring rain? Or can the heavens give showers? Are you not he, O Lord God? We set our hope on you, for you do all these things. What is true of God in the provision of rain is true of God in the rejuvenating of a human heart as well. Our only hope, the only hope that anyone has is found in God, in the God of all the world and His care and, and provision. And therein we see the limit of man. Though the kingdoms may seem powerful and they charge around the world with no one able to withstand them, yet there is a limit to their power. He cannot do the things of which his mouth boasts against the Lord. He is limited in his understanding, and even Daniel is limited in his understanding. You see that at the end, in, at the end of, of chapter 8. Daniel uh, says that he doesn't understand the vision. Now, we can say, well, what's wrong with Daniel? Doesn't he know about the Medes and the Persians and the Greeks? And the answer is no, he doesn't. He doesn't know about the Medes and the Persians and the Greeks. He, he hasn't even heard of the Greeks, probably, in terms of any kind of, of world power. It's ten years before the Medes and the Persians come into power. So it'd be like uh, God telling us of something that will happen 220 years from now, and, and we don't understand it. Well, of course we don't understand it. Because our understanding is limited. Our knowledge isn't as God's. He's puzzled with regard to the vision because he doesn't know all uh, the details. But what he does see and what he does understand is that the power of man may come and go at God's command, but the power of man is also limited. So as we consider that truth, let's, con let's uh, think of uh, two things that will make an impact on our lives today. And the first thing that we learn from this chapter is that we can expect godless men to stand in opposition to God. Any earthly ruler is opposed to God unless one thing is true of him, unless he is regenerated. Unless he is regenerated, every king of this world, every ruler of this world is hostile to God. Their plans are against him and their hearts will despise his word. When God says right, they will want to say wrong. When God says do this, they will shake their fist at him and say, no, I don't want to. And so in carrying out their plans, their evil will always overflow its container. You know what I mean, right? We have uh, little ones at home, and if I were to say to my little one, Calvin, he's two years old, and I'd give him a, a cup, a plastic cup, and I'd fill it up with water right to the brim, and I would say to him, Calvin, can you carry this cup to the table? Can you set it on the table? I know for sure I'm going to be on my hands and knees with a towel. 
following that line as wherever he walked because the water that's in that container will inevitably overflow its boundaries because he can't contain it. He can't, he can't manage the water and, and balance it. Okay, grown-ups, we know we can barely do that with a glass of water if it's filled to the top. And so it is with the king that has his heart set against God. The boundaries of his heart will overflow and what's inside his heart will always come out. Hatred towards God. Rebellion against him. This is the reality. We should expect godless men to stand in opposition to God. The contents of their heart will always overflow. This is the case of Nebuchadnezzar. This is the case of Belshazzar. It will be true for Antiochus and Epiphanes as, as Daniel anticipates his arrival. That's because of the truth that Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 34 when he says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Whatever is in your heart, if your heart is, is not washed with the blood of Christ, whatever is in your heart will come out. It doesn't always come out. You don't always look like a terrible human being if you're not regenerate. That's not what I'm saying. But when you're squeezed, when, when you're operating according to your nature, out of the overflow of your heart, out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth will speak. And if you're not regenerate, you will speak glory for me. If you're regenerate, you'll speak glory for God. And that's the difference. So, expect godless men uh, to stand in opposition to God. In the second place, we learn that we are to trust in the Lord and His sovereignty. Now, in our particular day and age, I think it's a circumstance of our time and the philosophy that sits at the foundation of, of how we operate as a, as a culture. But the sovereignty of God, especially in redemption, is often seen as a, as a negative thing. It, wasn't never, it was never a problem for the Philistines or the Ammonites. Or the, uh, it was never a problem for them. When, when David and his armies would, would array themselves against their enemies and their enemies recognized that they were about to be smitten by the people of God, they didn't say, uh, God, how could you do this to us? This is so unfair. I can't believe that you're operating sovereignly in the world that you made. It's never like that. Uh, but what they hoped to do, and blasphemously so, but they, they hope to have their God kind of overpower the God of the people of Israel, don't they? They never say this is not fair. They simply say, well, let's see if we can beat them. Right? There is a, 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 not a resignation to God's will, but there is an acceptance that God determines uh, the outcome of, of battles. But that's lost in our particular day. However, if you are in Christ, God's sovereignty should be a great comfort to you. Because uh, you're not depending on man. I'm not depending on this man uh, for my salvation. Uh, it's already impossible when I look at my heart and I know my thoughts, and I know what I've said to my children, to my wife, to people who live around me. I know that by my own actions I can't be saved because I have sin. And as soon as sin enters the world, God in the Garden of Eden tells me I deserve death. And so I am to trust in God and, and His deliverance. God's redemption, which is set by His determined De determination in time is, is the reason for our confidence. Uh, the, this morning when I went to Waynesboro, I, I preached the sermon I preached of the, the thief on the cross. The work of God, of redemption, accomplished through Christ Jesus. That that thief on the cross could turn to Christ and cry out to Him, and in response, Jesus says to this, this dying career criminal, Today, today you will be with me. In paradise. The redemption of God comes in, the, in His determination of time and in, through His work so that our confidence can remain secure. And because that's true, we don't need to fear circumstances. We don't need to fear men. It doesn't matter how powerful they are. That's how a, a little band of disciples at one, uh, at one point cowering in, in a room because of fear of the Jews, later uh, comes out 
and declares the gospel as Jewish men to Jewish people, saying, You want hope for your soul? He has come. He is Jesus of Nazareth. And He has died for your sins. We know about it. He's taught us all about it. He, he announced to us that this would take place, that He would come and, and, and he, would, he would suffer at the hands of the leaders of His, of his own nation and, and He would be laid in a grave. But after three days, He would be raised from the dead to prove, to prove one thing, that sin was atoned for, that the penalty for death has been overcome by Him, and that He now sits at the right hand of the Father to intercede for us. That is why we do not fear. We trust in God. We trust in the atoning work of Christ as, as we all do as we celebrate the Lord's Supper together this evening. The work of Christ, His perfect obedience to all the commandments of God, that is the reason for our confidence. That is the that is what sits behind joyful Christian living. It has nothing to do with, you, with what you've accomplished. It has everything to do with what Christ accomplished. And so, uh, in considering God's sovereignty here in this particular chapter, God's sovereignty over His own people, there is certainly an acknowledgement that God's people will suffer affliction from time to time. But that affliction that the people of God suffer is from God's own hand. And so while undergoing this type of affliction, the people of God can rest. They can rest in the certainty of God's sovereignty. Man's hand cannot triumph over God's people, not in a permanent sense. Their judgment will come, the judgment of the oppressors of God's people, and it comes at a determined time set by God Himself. And so we can serve Him in, in hardship and in ease. We can serve Him at all times, whether oppressed or whether free. And we can serve Him because we know, people of God, that He is sovereign over our deliverance and He is sovereign over our redemption. Let's pray together.